Right, we've been talking about tribes, about moves of God. Uh, we began talking a little bit in the last session about life cycles of a movement. I'm John Ruffle. Welcome back to my teaching show. Please do share these videos. If you've been blessed by them, don't keep them to yourself. Share them. You'll be doing the kingdom of God a benefit and maybe blessing and getting someone straightened out, getting them on the pathway to heaven, if you do. Life cycles of a movement. You know, we were thinking about why is it that, for instance, the charismatic movement within the Roman Catholic Church has kind of dwindled. And it's because there's waves, you know, waves of the sea, and the Holy Spirit will come and enter that wave, uh, sociological waves, and the Holy Spirit will be there to minister the gospel within that cultural setting which we've been talking about as a tribe. So if you like, the charismatic movement is a tribe within the Roman Catholic Church and it's been very uh, interdenominational, which has been an absolutely terrific benefit of the charismatic renewal. Now I'm part of a charismatic group that's been going for 35 years and we've, through this pandemic, we've come to a point where we realize that um, We've had to reevaluate everything we've met for the past year on Zoom every week. Um, and more recently, we've joined forces with a Catholic charismatic prayer group in Ireland. And so that's been a tremendous blessing to join forces with the Emmaus Road Fellowship in Ireland. And my prayer is that that group, uh, combined with members from our group, might grow in strength and strength as they continue in prayer and praise and worship, I'm sure that it will. But as far as the charismatic renewal being a movement that is going to completely revolutionize the church, I think God's got something else in store. And um, I'm thinking in terms of, for the Catholics among you, you may or may not have heard of the ministry of divine renovation. Divine renovation. And divine renovation works very much in parallel and in partnership with Alpha Course. And of course, there is an Alpha within the Catholic context. And you can run an Alpha Course. You know, the great thing about Holy Trinity Brompton, which is a, an Anglican church, I've been there many times and I've met some of the leadership there as well in times past. Holy Trinity Brompton is a very generous church they will allow any group to run the Alpha course without cost. You just have to register. And the resources, the videos and so forth are available free of charge to registered groups. Now, it hasn't always been that way because back uh, some years ago, people would, were, were pirating the Alpha course and calling it the Alpha course and making it into something completely different. And so um, the Alpha, you know, Alpha at Holy Trinity Brompton, who originated it, had a little bit of challenge on their hands. What do they do? Because they wanted to make the thing available freely, but they needed to protect its, its uh, integrity as a course uh, that's sharing the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And, you know, I think what they've done is actually quite spectacular. They've got a new set of videos out over the last few years that really do engage people and... Um, because of the online ability to register and so forth, they can actually allow access to it, but within a, a not a control setting, but within a, um, a uh, what's the word for it? Um, and a, within accountability, which I think is fantastic. A word about the Alpha course here while we're on it and tribalism. I've got friends that don't like the current videos. I think they're fantastic. Um, they take you all around the world. You see uh, participants involved in in skydiving and all sorts of things. In fact, I can't think of a name. The uh, one of the co-presenters on the new Alpha course is actually one of the presenters on CBBC, on Children's BBC Television Network. So they'll be familiar to a lot of children. And I think it's absolutely well done. Some of my friends don't like it because they can't relate to all of the 
20 uh, something adventure activities that it's based around. And again, this is an example of tribalism. Because if you are a young professional, you'll be able to relate to those videos so easily. If you are just for instance, living on the top floor of a high rise flat, you're probably far more concerned about whether or not the cladding on your high rise building is flammable or not because of what happened a couple of years ago, Grenfell Towers, that tragedy. You're probably far more concerned about that or far more concerned about uh, the neighbors up the corridor getting busted for drugs or something or prostitution going on and so forth or needles being left in the public spaces you're probably far more concerned about that than you are about whether or not you can climb mount kilimanjaro or jump out of an airplane at twenty thousand feet whatever it is so i do get that again it's this example of tribalism uh, but for the people who can identify with it it's absolutely fantastic set of videos highly recommend it i'd recommend people that aren't into all that stuff Watch them anyway, because it will open your aspirations. People watch so David Attenborough on television is wildlife stuff all the time. They don't complain. Oh, well, I can't go on a wildlife safari. I can't do what David Attenborough is doing. They don't do that. They watch it and, they, and like the wildlife stories. But then they watch an alpha video and they can't. They say, oh, I can't relate to it. OK, I've got one word for you guys try <laughs> just try it and that actually is the story of my life with alpha because when alpha launched and for a number of years after it launched i really didn't like alpha um i, really, I was part of a home group a holy trinity brompton home group in the 1980s that predated alpha it was a cracking home group. It was really, really good. It was in a, uh, the guy that ran it had a big house in Chelsea. And so it was able to accommodate a lot of people. It was really, really on fire home group. But when Alpha came along, I ignored it for at least the first 10, 15 years because I couldn't relate to it. I just didn't get it at all. Now, one day I thought to myself, John, you are very very prejudiced and prideful because you don't like alpha you've never done it you've never tried it you've just blocked yourself from it it's about time you sorted yourself out and this is the same way with many of us with different prejudices that we have it's about time we sort ourselves out so i enrolled on a local alpha and i was blown away it was before the current new series of alpha videos came out as well i was blown away man it was terrific especially the small groups because i saw people's lives transform in front of me week after week people that started on week one as being acclaimed self-professed atheists and i saw them very slowly like you know those um slow motion uh videos of of flowers evolving and the petals coming out and they're growing it was like that it was seeing someone come to faith in christ in slow motion over the weeks and it culminated about 12 weeks later with uh, one particular individual work for british airways as it happened actually coming to faith in christ and making a commitment to christ and being baptized by immersion in water in an anglican church in west london uh, and so God had to get my thinking renewed in that area. And if you've got prejudices, if you don't like something, you never checked it out, it could be anything, then find, ask the Holy Spirit, is this something I need, that you need to adjust in my life? Is it something I need to change? And of course, this all goes back to tribalism, because tribalism is like, this is my group and you're outside my group. So I don't want to have anything to do with you. This is my group here. But actually, there might be somebody over here, a completely different setting and group, who's got something really valuable they can give to your group. 
God deals with groups. He doesn't only deal with individuals. We live in an individualistic world. That's one of the problems and we get lost of the idea of community, of genuine community. You know, when I talk about community, I can guarantee that most of the people, at least near around me, will immediately think of their local physical community in which they live in. But actually the community starts for a Christian. The community starts within the church. It's the church community. And we need to build up the church community, not so that we can form the image of the greater community, but so we can be lights for the community within that setting, within that tribal setting, if you will. So God's doing a new thing. And one of the reasons why, just to get back to the original theme, of life cycle of a movement. And my friend Ron Junkel preached on this many, many years ago. It was recorded, we recorded it, it's called the life cycle of a movement. And Ron, if you're watching today, I desperately want that tape so far out of hundreds of friends who know Ron and myself None of us have been able to dig out a copy of this early tape, 1972, Life Cycle of a Movement by Ron Junkles. If you've got one, if you're watching from Gospel Outreach and you've got one, please send it to me in the physical cassette tape or the reel-to-reel if, you, if you've got the reel-to-reel or just send me an MP3 because I really want to remaster that and get it out to people. But Life Cycle of Movement, just in a nutshell, is that once you get, and this isn't what Ron said, it's what I say. Life cycle of movement is when you have that common identity, let's say it's the counterculture back in the 60s and 70s. But then you come to Christ and you begin to lose all the worldly stuff. Imagine a space rocket lifts off from Cape Canaveral and the first stage rocket falls away. And the second stage rocket falls away. You get all these stages falling away until it's leaving the atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is, starts on its journey. So the, the fuel and rockets and everything that makes it so big have all fallen away. And that's rather like we are in our culture, in our, in our tribe. We start off in a tribe and then someone share, from the tribe, someone shares the gospel with us and it connects with us. We, we can relate to it emotionally. Uh, we can we're on the same page worldview wise etc now they're sharing jesus and now you have a choice to either say hey you know i want this jesus or you just reject and go back to your tribalism but this person has come to christ this is the point i'm making this person has come to christ doesn't stay just lock stock in that tribe they begin to rise as the word of God takes root and effect in their lives, the good soil, the word of God grows in the good soil and they become conformed, process, lifelong process, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that means that a lot of the initial identity of the tribalism begins to fall away like a space rocket, like the stages of a space rocket. So that means that, that individual goes through a different phase of life. That person, they, they might have the gift of evangelism, got friends who've got the gift of evangelism. That's great. They can still continue to relate. But most people, they will then be in a position where they can help encourage, mentor, and disciple other people, other Christians within the tribal setting that are less mature and are still in contact with that tribe. This is exactly what happened in the Jesus movement. We had, um, gosh, right off the top of my head, he's a friend of mine, <laughs> Ken, um, Ken Philpot. Ken Philpot was an evangelist and he moved to California and he got involved with some of these hippie Christians. He wasn't a hippie himself. He got involved in some of these hippie Christians and he was able to mentor and just begin to disciple some of the Christians. There was a couple of pastors within Northern California, I'm speaking of Northern California here, 
there was a number of pastors that could see beyond just the walls of their congregation and reached out to uh, Ted Weiss, Ted and Elizabeth Weiss in particular. Liz Weiss came to faith in Jesus Christ while her husband was still high on acid and doing dope and all sorts of crazy stuff. And uh, he was building boats and things in Sausalito and hobnobbing with people, but his life was empty. But his wife had recovered her faith and began going to church on Sundays in a straight church. But that straight, when I say straight, like very conventional, but the pastor of that, quote, very conventional church reached out to Ted and Liz and through love won Ted to Christ and continued to disciple him while he went out and won other hippies for Christ. So as we get older, we don't have to just disengage with society. It's just our reference point within society changes a bit. And our reference point within the church changes a little bit. So that we grow up, we become fathers, you know, in the faith. And so we are able to minister discipleship, counsel, godly wisdom, prayer to those who are right there on the cutting edge, still very much embedded within the culture, but seeking to live a holy life. Right, I think I'm going to close with the same scripture we began with because it's easy. I'm, I'm charismatic Pentecostal myself. Um, and I've been in pastoral ministry for many, many years. Um, whether or not I'm called a pastor or not, I couldn't care less. It's the gifting of God is without repentance. is what God has done in my life, which is important. It's the call of God on my life. It's important. It's not titles. Um, and I just want to share how important the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is to make us holy, I'm saying this as a charismatic, I'm saying this as a Pentecostal. The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is not so that miracles can take place, other than the miracle of a transformed life. That is the number one predominant ministry and miracle God offers to us, a reborn life. That is the miracle of all miracles. You can't always see it, you can't always touch it, you can't experience it with your five physical senses very often, which is why people tend to overlook it. And what it takes is repentance and faith. Just turn your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, change me, rejuvenate me. You haven't been a Christian all your life. God is saying to you today, will you trust me with the remainder of your days? Will you put your hand in the hand of the Master Yield your life to Jesus Christ and allow him to be the pilot of your ship. Let him be the captain of your aircraft. Let him be the driver of your car. Let him be the author and finisher of your faith. Let him be the journey and the destination. Let him be your all in law. Let him be your desire. Let him be your vision. Let him be your future because he loves you so much. Jesus died for love. He died with a broken heart of love for you and for me. And he's welcoming you home today into his kingdom. And here in chapter four of First Thessalonians, verse three, Paul writing, he says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Brothers and sisters, to live the life of God, it takes us to yield to the Holy Spirit. It really, really does. And he's inviting you today to drink from the well of salvation. In the name of Jesus. Amen.